Welcome to Bullion Bulletin. Now I am sitting with Mr. Philip Klapswick. He is a veteran and is a very knowledgeable person in the gold market and he is currently the director of uh, uh, Precious Metals Insight. He formed a new company after he left his earlier where he was a director in GFMS. Welcome sir, welcome to Bullion Bulletin Thank and you, you are much. the best person I feel to talk about <laughs> the Asian market. So okay. first I start with Hong Kong. Yes. You have uh, spent 10, more than 10 years in that market. So what was there in 10 years back and today Hong Kong market, what changes you see and what the changes you are expecting in next 5 years in a very simple words. Well, I think Hong Kong is obviously benefited tremendously from the growth of the China market. Mm -hmm. Already prior to 10 years ago, it had already started to benefit in the 1990s. Uh, latterly, I think Hong Kong's role has perhaps started to be, I wouldn't use the word eclipse, but certainly challenged by developments in mainland China itself, uh, with Shanghai emerging as the key center in the Asian time zone and Hong Kong to some extent therefore being relegated to to a sort of second division uh, compared to let's say what looks to be the future lineup of London, New York and Shanghai. A lot of infrastructure development uh, has happened in London for example we have a Hong Kong spot exchange uh, or what is this called? Ch uh, CGSC. Uh, CGSC is Shanghai project with yeah. Shenzhen. Uh, so yes, and then we have a very strong jewelry chain. Mm. Uh, it has very strong export market. Yes. So it is competing well with. Well, I think Shanghai to start with that is quite an interesting um, way of potential potentially continuing to maintain Hong Kong's relevance, uh, mm. particularly in terms of linking China with the outside world. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think, a means of bringing onto us, shall we say, a recognized and established platform in future, uh, a lot of business that's currently conducted in, shall we say, sort of less formal channels or not on an exchange, mm. uh, and whether a greater inefficiencies um, which can be ironed out through uh, the potential uh, Shanghai Hong Kong corridor. Uh, now uh, little focus uh, just outside of Hong Kong now uh, this uh, uh, what is your uh, assessment uh, Indonesia Philippines these two countries have developed a strong mining fraternity coal mining fraternity but uh, other than that, uh, the other countries, it some countries uh, or the all the countries have a little bit of gold deposits, I, I suppose, yes. based on the geographic location. Yeah, well, I mean, at the end of the day, um, it's what you've been blessed with by nature yeah. in terms of gold deposits, mm. which is ultimately going to be important. Then there are all sorts of other issues which come into play in terms of government policy accessibility of resources, mm -hmm. the foreign investor, investment climate, um, the ability to mobilize capital to exploit those resources. Now, if we look at the ASEAN region, uh, as you correctly point out, Indonesia and the Philippines have a, a long history in, in gold mining, uh, with in particular Indonesia hosting a couple of the world's largest yeah. mines. Um, if we look at the rest of the region, though, I think it's really probably only Myanmar where there is great potential in future and, and mm. that's really I think a recognition of the fact that the Myanmar economy has been relatively closed uh, in the past. Uh, also there's been a, f a fair amount of civil conflict, there still right. is to some extent. Um, but hopefully in future the uh, potential there uh, will be uh, developed and, and we'll see Myanmar move up the ranking in terms of gold mining uh, countries. Mm. So. Uh, what about the other locations, so for example, uh, Cambodia, Le Laos, I came to know after coming here, Yes, there are some amount of gold that is coming out of this uh, and based on the size of the country, 
those uh, amount is not so small. So uh, Malaysia actually have some problem or Thailand has some regulatory issues regarding the environmental mm. problem. So they imposed uh, some ban on the. Uh, so is there any potential for direct investment, foreign direct investment to this market? Well, um, I think one would have to look at what sort of exploration companies are up to uh, in the region, get some idea of the potential perhaps for countries such as Laos or Cambodia. But you know, my understanding is that the if we look at where the potential gold resources are, they're, they're probably still rather more in the two countries you mentioned, Philippines and Indonesia. Uh, particularly, I think, Indonesia, uh, and probably also that Myanmar has, has got some gold treasures that, that, that are potentially open for development in, in future. Whether there could be the odd project also in Laos or, uh, or Cambodia, well, qu quite possibly. I mean, after all, it's not as if there isn't gold mining in Thailand. Right. Although I think most people would say Thailand's never going to become a you know, first rank or second rank even gold producer. So now coming uh, to an, uh, one step further as on the uh, financialization of the coal market and the infrastructure, financial infrastructure of the coal. So now talking, if I talk about Singapore, so what potentially we are seeing, a lot of things uh, really since the lift up ban on the 2012 on the investment gain gold on GST ban. So now we are seeing a lot of trade volume has increased. Uh, so what? Uh, where are you seeing Singapore in the next five years? Well, I, I think Singapore is quite well placed, firstly, to be the prime, um, if you like, regional hub for the ASEAN yeah. countries. Um, Singapore brings a lot of advantages to the table in terms of uh, legal system, infrastructure that's fully developed here, banking system, yeah, finance. Exactly right. uh, of course, you've got a refinery, uh, which is world-class refinery, yeah. transport companies that are... are domiciled here. So you, you've got a package which is very appealing, uh, particularly in the context of other countries which, which don't have all of those sort of systems developed. Mm. So I, I think firstly um, it will be an important hub for refining uh, dore uh, and scrap gold mm. from these countries. Uh, it can also send out uh, refined bullion products and, and probably also semis uh, to the investment and jewellery communities uh, in, in those ASEAN countries. I think in addition, Singapore does have the possibility to play a wider role, uh, not just within the region, but also further afield um, as a depository for uh, gold. Um, it's a very safe and good storage location for high net worth individuals, possibly also for institutions and even for central banks in future. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, Singapore's got some pretty strong cards to play. Um, but at the same time, I think it, it needs to play to its its strengths. Um, Singapore isn't, I think, in a, in in a hurry going to take away, for example, Hong Kong's very close relationship it has with the China market, which is very much a function of sort of links between companies that have feet in both Hong Kong and Shenzhen. Uh, it's a function of geographic proximity, of course, and. The fact that you have a very established set of uh, working relationships between mainland China and Hong Kong, which is, is going to be very difficult, I think, uh, to disrupt and to move, uh, shall we say, further south. Uh, but I think in terms of ASEAN and in terms of the investor market, particularly perhaps the high net worth uh, and perhaps also fund investor uh, storage, physical gold storage market, I think Singapore's got... Uh, some very good cards really. Now it's says China, mm. uh, that economy has slowed down, still economy has gone big, so 11% to 6%, still it is a very good number. I feel like that, 6% mm. growth of China is a very big. In this context, in the current context, with the growth of 6 to 6 point half, uh, where do you see the demand of gold will remain in China? Well, I think firstly, it's it's questionable that over the say next five to ten years that China can maintain six six and a half percent growth. I very much doubt it. In fact, okay. Um, given the fact that we're now talking about six percent or whatever it'll be, three four percent growth on a very much bigger number mm. in terms of GDP, yeah, absolute GDP, right. and also that this this is now quite a, in some respects quite a mature economy, yeah. particularly if you look at the sort of major 
East Coast um, cities, uh, we're, we're looking already at quite high p per capita GDP. It's a middle income country. So right. they have to try and avoid the middle income trap in terms of slower economic growth. And looking at demographics, it's going to be tough for them to do that. They've also got to transition from an economy that's been based very much on very uh, and excessively high levels of investment mm. and also net exports to one that's much more dependent on consumption. And this is against the backdrop, uh, as I said, of a demographic picture that's that's darkening. So I, th I think the premise is probably not that they're going to get six and a, six and a half percent, but probably something more like three to four percent in the in the longer run, which is still a good rate of growth, by yeah, you. Um, under those circumstances, I think you're, you're going to get wealth created and some of that wealth is going to go into, into gold. I think gold will continue to be relevant, particularly as a portfolio diversifier for uh, wealth in China. Mm -hmm. But I think at the same time as the economy gets richer, people get more sophisticated, they're going to be looking at other ways of trying to get income on, on mm -hmm. their assets and they're not just going to have a knee-jerk reaction, we've got spare cash, let's put it into gold. So. You know, it's on the one hand, um, the rising tide will, I think, float all boats, and gold is still a relevant and interesting asset for a lot of people. But they will see the development of new products, uh, particularly new products, if and when RMB is internationalized, current account is freed, and Chinese investors have greater freedom to invest abroad. So I, I think. It'll be interesting to see how the investment space develops in China. I, th I think there's still scope for growth, but I think we shouldn't get too carried away because there will be competing products and there will particularly be competing products if, if the um, financial uh, conditions are liberalized in China. Uh, in terms of jewelry, I think we're already seeing a market that's changing quite rapidly away from a commodity type of product to jewellery that's much more designed to appeal to people's emotions and to sort of gifting motives as opposed to, uh, let's say, an investment vehicle. And I think that probably means that demand numbers in terms of volume don't have a huge amount of upside. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the next couple of years, I think could still go down, including this year. Um, in terms of spend on jewellery, on the other hand, I, I think there's you know, scope for, for continued growth in the jewellery market and people actually might make more money looking at the trade uh, than they've done recently with this you know, very low margin commodity product where you know, there's too much supply and it's difficult for a lot of people to make money on, on a you know, very low margin commoditized product. So I think as the market moves to more higher added value products, uh, I think we'll have a healthier jewellery industry, which will make more profit. Uh, but the scope for volume growth will not be there the way it was in the 1990s and 2000s. The SBMA uh, repeat this next year. I think they've managed to probably carve out quite a nice niche for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very encouraging to see people from so many countries, uh, not just in the ASEAN region, but also further afield, you know, come together in this space and you know, listen to a lot of uh, interesting topics and speakers. Thank you, sir. I know you can continue full nights, kind of experience <laughs> you have. Thank you. And I always have a desire to talk to you, but uh, it is a limited time for me and you Thank also. Thank you very much. So, I will be looking forward to talk to you. Bullion Bulletin will always look forward uh, to talk to people like you. Uh, who have contributed enough uh, hugely in the global precious metals market. Well, thank you very much.